Harriet Jacobs, um, we've talked briefly about her because um, is she also Linda Brent? Is that Linda? Yeah, Linda, yeah. she's the same person? Absolutely. So, and in fact, um, Harriet Jacobs, the author of Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, written by herself, um, that came out in 1861. She called herself Linda Brent while writing the narrative, and she gave fictionalized names to the people, you know, functioning in that narrative. So Dr. James Norcom was the person claiming ownership over her. She called him Dr. Flint in the narrative and so on. So I love that we can mention her today because tomorrow, March 7th, is the day that she became an ancestor. And my belief mm -hmm. is that it is on Harriet Jacobs' shoulders that um, the Me Too movement um, that Tarana Burke birthed, the, that is where that stands on her shoulders because Harriet Jacobs was the first formerly enslaved African-American woman to write her life story in a way that emphasized what it meant to have the state sanction your sexual vulnerability. And that is what her narrative did. 1845, uh, wow. Frederick Douglass's narrative written by himself gave us a picture of Aunt Hester and what it meant for Black women to be enslaved. Harriet Jacobs in 1861 tells it from the direct perspective of someone who was objectified in those ways, and it changed the game. So yes, yeah, she became an ancestor March 7th, 1897 in the nation's capital. The other thing that's so important about understanding her, incidents in the life of a slave girl tells us her life story, but one of the things that's so remarkable is that she hid for six years and 11 months in the crawl space above her grandmother's storage shed. And it is because of that remarkable move that she made. She was operating out of desperation, but also ingenuity, Karen, because she, from that crawl space, wrote letters to Dr. Norcom, fooling him into believing that she was already in the North. So to have her narrative- wow is life-changing and has been life-changing for me. That's why I have an edition of Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl coming out in June. But again, what I want to bring this up about this attic space to you is because that incredible part of her story is part of the reason why literary scholars and historians thought for a long time that it was a fiction. And so it has taken decades of archival research to prove that it was not fiction. And she really was in that crawl space for six years and 11 months. Um, a historian named Jean Fagan Yellen did that work. And I make all of that work accessible in the edition I'm about to do. But again, I believe that hashtag Me Too and Tarana Burke, her example, whenever I see Tarana Burke moving in the world, talking in the community oriented ways that she talks, I see Harriet Jacobs' legacy in motion. Mm. How did you uh, come upon her? And what, what yeah. when, when? Yeah, it wasn't until graduate school. Um, and I was taking a class about white and black women writers of the United States. And that is where I was introduced to it. Once I became a professor, it became one of those books that I taught every chance I could because it gives you such a clear sense of American culture and the way that American culture is designed to keep certain people in their proper place. This is part of the reason why I'm so clear about patriarchy. I'm so clear about what masculinity means in the American context and what we lose when we buy into that. Because the truth is what you read from Harriet Jacobs is the way that American society has been built on the idea that being head of household is really akin to being the head of household of a whole plantation. You're a real man when you have the property in mm -hmm. having it over the white woman and these enslaved the people. Yeah. I'm, so. I'm, I I know that Harry Jacobs had uh she she fell in love with a man and wanted to marry him. Yep. Black man and he wanted to buy her freedom. He was free. Yep. yep. And her master who uh was sexually her, uh, raping her and sexually assaulting her uh refused to allow that union and his wife Missy Ann was jealous. So you so you're navigating all of this don't got nothing to do with you. 
you yeah. know. And you know what's so powerful about the moment you bring up, right, is that that becomes a turning point in the narrative. He says, if I catch him lurking around my premises, I'll shoot him as soon as I would a dog. That's what he says about her first love. And what you see in the narrative is that she changes her definition of what her womanly success will be. From that point, instead of thinking she can become a protected wife and mother, she decides, how do I determine what's happening to my body? So Dr. Flint in the narrative at that point, not only threatens her lover, he also is about to build a cottage where she can be his concubine away from his jealous wife. And that's when she gets serious and says, okay, let me go ahead and get this yeah. other white man to stop this situation. And that's how she takes more control.